the brain. It is absolutely the most incredible thing. It is so amazing. It weighs about three pounds, and it uses 20 to 25 percent of the oxygen and any and 20 to 25 percent of circulating glucose. The brain is 60 percent fat, and it uses up to 25 percent of the cholesterol that we make. It has about 1.1 trillion cells. It has 100 billion neurons that average anywhere that average around about 5,000 different connections for each uh, and connections and, and, and synapses. The brain activity is a lightning fast, and it's always on. It sculpts not only who we are, but also the world that we experience. It tells us what to see, what to hear, and what to say, and it helps us with learning a new language or skill. It tells stories when we're sleeping, and it sends alarm signals and spurs the body to run or fight when it senses danger. The brain adapts to the environment, and our brain also looks to the sun to tell us what, uh, tell our body what time it is. The brain stores memories, both painful and pleasant. And as amazing as the brain is, there are so many different things that actually impact the brain. So we know, for example, the brain is impacted by diet. It's really, really impacted by sugar. It gets inflamed. It has a connection with the gut bacteria. So things like toxins, hormones, all of those impact the brain. Our genes, too, there's also some impact with what turns on the healthier genes and what doesn't turn on the healthy genes. It impacts the brain's function. Sleep, relationships, movement, stress, love, fun, all of these things impact the brain. And what it it links to are things like mood and cravings, weight gain, fatigue, irritability, insomnia, more and more of those things. All of that is also linked to what impacts the brain. So we know that the gut bacteria or our microbiome is completely linked to the brain's function. In fact, there's the the gut-brain axis. So the digestion and how we digest our foods is very impactful to how the brain functions. And lots of times patients will tell me that certain foods affect their mood, and it starts off with how they digest them, how they absorb those foods, and what impact and how they travel to and affect the brain's function. So the most impactful are going to be sugar, refined carbs, and gluten. Many other things too, but those are the places where there is lots of data and research around them. Sugar, we know, impacts every aspect of the body, but the aspect of sugar also relates to AGESs, where the protein is damaged by sugar in the brain. But then also insulin. Insulin plays a role of promoting inflammation in the brain. And at one stage, they were talking about insulin um, and Alzheimer's being kind of like a type 3 diabetes, the impact of insulin and how the brain functions. So we, for that reason, we really want to control the blood sugar. So the other part, I actually, the one I did leave out too was also alcohol, but we'll get to that one too. So let's look at carbohydrates. So carbohydrates fall into four different categories. Vegetables, fruit, legumes, so the legumes being the beans and the peas, lentils, uh, soy, all of those. And then the grains. So the grains are going to be pasta and wheat and uh, millet and oatmeal and quinoa and rice, all of that. That's the umbrella for the grains. But the most Definitely the most impactful of that is going to be a gluten because it has all of these lectins in them that promote inflammation, not only with the gut, but certainly to the brain as well. You can actually follow Dr. Perlmutter, David Perlmutter, who's a neurologist, and all the information that he's come up with over the years in how the brain, how inflammation is promoted through the use of using some of the gluten stuff. Now, the other part is alcohol. So alcohol impacts the brain where it impairs memory, it reduces the brain size, it causes some brain cell dysfunction. Of course, it affects the gut bacteria too. And it's linked with depression, anxiety, and mood disorders. And women are much more affected by alcohol than men, sadly. 
But alcohol is broken down into what is known as acetylhydes, and it's done, and this happens by a detoxifying enzyme called alcohol dehydrogenase. Now, women have less of this enzyme, so the alcohol stays in the body much longer. And it has the impact of um, sleep dysfunction, it impacts hormones, it, and it impacts how women feel, especially the day after they've drunk alcohol. So we want to watch how much of that we drink, and if you are prone to moods or have some anxiety, then alcohol is probably not the thing you want to be doing. So the grains, of course, the grains is always, a, a, there's a major debate, and especially now, because really, and I, I can um, confess to this too, it's reaching out for the grains, anything that's more carby, carbohydrate especially when we get stressed, those are the things that we do. And I've seen it with myself, I'm baking cakes, I never bake cakes. But still, it's just being aware of where we are with these carbohydrates because not only does it affect the digestive system, but it affects the entire body. But the better grains to, we, to eat probably would be things like rice and quinoa and even corn would probably be better than, say, some of the gluten. But if you're going to do gluten, it should be sourdough because that flour is already fermented, it's a little easier for digestion, and it impacts the microbiome in a more positive way. So those would be the better breads. Of course, the legumes are great because they have a high amount of fiber in them. And if we're talking about the category of carbohydrates between legumes and carbs, then the legumes would be the better choice. And there are so many great beanie things that you can do now, and especially through, uh, through COVID-19 and sitting at home or even going home and cooking meals, opening up a can of beans and adding maybe some pasta sauce to that, more olive oil, because we'll get to that part too, and maybe even some grated parmesan on, the, on, the, on something like that with lots of greens would be very beneficial. So what are the things that are important for the brain? Certainly, when it comes to the body and every cell in the body, we start off with the phytochemicals, which are from, from vegetables. We want to be eating lots and lots of those. But specific to the brain, the cruciferous vegetables are really important. So those are broccoli and Brussels sprouts and cabbage and kale and arugula and uh, bok choy, all of these are extremely important because they're involved with detoxification. So we help to clear the junk from the body by eating lots of these vegetables, but they have phytochemicals too that are extremely positive for, for the function of the body and especially for the brain. So to the vegetables, after the vegetables, the berries. So from a fruit point of view, the berries are hugely impactful because they have those, again, those phytonutrients and the flavors which we find in the berries, especially the blue and the black, are really, really good for the brain. So they may, they're the ones that give uh, the fruit and vegetables that purple color. So, so good for the brain's function. The next thing that we look at is going to be fat. Remember that the brain is 60%, 64% fat, so we, we need to be having fat for the brain's function. And gone are those days where everyone's on a low-fat diet. Now, the preference is for a much higher fat. But there are some good fats and there are some unhealthy fats. So the best fats, of course, are going to be things like avocados, butter. Yes, there's a link with that in cholesterol, but remember, the brain uses 25% of the cholesterol we make in the body. So we need to have some of that. So butter is a really good form of, of fat. Flax, oil, coconut, all factors of coconut, meaning coconut oil, coconut butter, coconut cream, coconut milk, all of those, those parts of coconut are also extremely healthy for the brain. MCT oil, so MCT oil is a medium chain triglyceride oil, but then so and it and it's derived from coconut, but it's 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 what they use in most of the ketogenic diets, and of course keto, the way keto was researched was what is the impact of keto, a high fat diet, low to medium protein, and very low on the starches, but 
an emphasis on the on the leafy greens and some of the broccolis, how does that impact the brain's function? And that was the link with with the research around that, and then that translated to all other diseases. So the keto was really for the brain's function, but it's 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 really about the high fat. The fats we probably want to avoid at all costs is going to be things like canola and sunflower and corn oil and mazola, vegetable oils, so, soy oils, margarines. You know, I can't believe it's not bad and not a great thing to be having in your diet. These oils have been extracted using solvents or a mechanical process called extrusion, which involves high heat. So there's a damage to these oils anyway. And then when you ingest them, they impact all the cell membranes and then, of course, because we have so much fat tissue in the brain, certainly going to be impacting the function of those. The other parts, if we look at this, is, is fish. So sardines, herring, salmon, all of those fatty fish, really important for the brain's function. And eggs, let's not forget eggs. Eggs have high amounts of DHA. So when we think about fish oils, fish oils in, in a supplement form come with two different molecules, EPA and DHA. DHA is predominantly used for the brain's function. And we find a high amount of DHA in the egg yolks. We also have choline and acetylcholine, which are really important for the brain, specifically for neurotransmitters and signaling, membranes and signaling, cell signaling in the brain. So eggs are really important. And um, having two a day is a great idea because it's a great protein as well. So from the brain's point of view, protein is also very important because it's in, involved with how we balance control blood sugar, but it's involved with um, neurotransmitters, balancing sugar and insulin and hormones. All of these are important from a brain point of view and for mood and therefore mood. So some of the healthier foods that we would probably be considering eating would be these. So you would, vegetables, of course, fats and oils, lots of avocados. Don't forget the avos. And plus they're delicious. They make food taste really, really good. Dairy plays a role too. So as long as you don't have a lactose or a casein, a casein, uh, reaction, then dairy is not a bad food to be having. But you want to be having the fermented dairy, so that would be the yogurts, the unflavored, the Greek high fat. Don't go with the low fat. And then some of the cheeses too. So speaking as a cheeseaholic, it always, it always gladdens me when I know that cheese is on my diet. Uh, the other part too is, is chocolate. Chocolate has some PEA in it and some other phytochemicals that are really important for the brain. Make sure it's over 70%. The higher the cacao, the, the more functional it's going to be, which makes everyone really happy. Coffee and the teas also are important. So black and, and green tea have, again, those phytonutrients that are in, impactful for, for the brain's function. So what, if you were thinking about breakfast, you could have something like eggs and avocado, or you could have soups. You know, soups, we can have soups any time of the day, but it's really great for breakfast. Lunch could be something like salad with chicken, some avocado, and add more olive oil to it. We like the taste. Humans like the taste of fat. And olive oil has something like 30 different, different flavones or isoflavones that are so important for the brain's function and for the entire body, actually. You could do something with sardines. Open up a can of sardines and mash them up. Put a little bit of mayo, some lemon juice. I like hot sauce, maybe a drop or two of Cholula, and have that with some avocados. On your salad, if you're having that, you could open up a jar, a little jar of anchovies, mush them up, add them to your salad dressing, and then pour that over your salad. Yummy, really yummy. Uh, and don't forget to add and 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 don't forget to add some nuts to your salad too. So dinner could be something like fish, broccoli, and a sweet potato and a green salad, and maybe you can add a tablespoon of sauerkraut to that. Um, again, because we're thinking about the gut, bacteria, and the brain's function. Dessert, you could have some berries, and I like to t open up a can of coconut cream or coconut milk and scoop a tablespoon of the white stuff, which is really the, 
the part that we want the most of. The water is a little bit too sweet and put that with berries. And sometimes I just use frozen berries so it's kind of like a an ice cream feel to it but the, the fat from the coconut is just absolutely yummy. So when we talk about intermittent fasting, so the other part about this is having a break from from food. Um, it takes so much energy to digest food. And if we're constantly eating, then all the energy is directed down this 22 feet of digestive tubing. And then the other cells in the body don't get a bit of a showing. So the energy is concentrated down the digestive system. And then other things like the other cells having general health cleaning or some detoxification, also known as autophagy, doesn't happen. So that's the reason why intermittent fasting has been found to really reduce inflammation across all systems in the body, from brain to cardiovascular to diabetes, hormonal balance. IF has been found to be very positive with that. So there are many plans for intermittent fasting, but probably the most simple one is Cut out the snacking. Have three meals a day and cut out the snacking. We don't need all of that, all of those different calories. The other part about intermittent fasting, we normally fast for 12 hours. And if you can extend it to 16, that will be even more beneficial. So if your last meal was at 8 o'clock at night, your next meal would be at noon. If your last meal was at 7 at night, your next meal would be at 11. So it's just giving the body some time to catch up with all the food that we consume, and it reduces inflammation system-wide. You can have coffee or tea when, you, when you're fasting. You just don't add anything that has protein or carbohydrate in it. So you can add some fats to that. You can do the whole MCT oil bulletproof thing with, with your coffee, or you could add some just some MCT oils to your teas in the morning. But those are the things that really help to to help with the brain function. Um, I, have some, I have two recipes that you might be interested in. One is a um, salmon poached in a coconut and saffron broth, which is really delicious. And the other one is a bulletproof recipe that I sent on in one of my first uh, talks, but it's really great because it's got the chocolate and the coconut oil in it. And so if you're interested in those recipes, send me, drop me an email and I'll get those off to you.